Hey guys, in the last few videos, we've talked about the new Dig Octa digitally addressable LED controller system that's going to be released soon. This video is no different, except this time we're going to take a look at three power boards that will be initially released once everything becomes available. They all have their unique reasons for existing again, giving you flexibility to choose whichever suits your situation best. Let's take a look. As mentioned in the introduction video, there will be two power boards capable of handling up to 50 amps continuous and one which is a HC variant or high current variant that is actually rated up to 100 amps continuous. That is quite a lot of power to run through your board so it took a bit of designing to get that right, but testing on the latest revision is showing great results. Before taking a look at each individual power board and their unique features, let's first take a look at the shared features between all the boards. To start off, all power boards support automatic 5 volt, 12 volt or 24 volt operation. No need to set a dip switch or jumper or anything like that. Also, all current power boards support having multiple power boards in a stack with each having their own power supply. Better yet, each power board can have their own voltage while still being in the same stack. So you can build a Dig Octa stack, which has a power board running at five volt and another at 12 volt without an issue. One thing to note is that one power board can never have more than one power supply. The multiple input terminals are there to run multiple cables from the same power supply to minimize voltage drop between your power supply and the power board, not to connect multiple power supplies. If you have multiple power boards in a stack, however, you can share a single power board between these. For instance, if you have a Meanwell LRS 600-5, which can output 100 amps at 5 volt, it's fine to divide its power over two normal power boards, which are rated for up to 50 amps each. All current power boards also support the Q power post system, allowing it to feed power to the brain boards in your stack, even if mixed voltages are present. The power boards also have a special orange connector, which can be used in the case of not using Q power post to power a brain board. These outputs are slightly different versus the normal outputs on the board in that they have an automatic fuse and are current limited with backfeed protection in place. Then to make sure power is as stable as it can be, the power boards each have two big bulk capacitors on the board next to having a one UF capacitor per output, allowing for quick responses to varying loads and also soaking up some of those transients LEDs can generate for the power supply. All engineered to keep power flow to the LEDs as stable as possible. Each port also has rudimentary reverse polarity protection built in, which will try to kill the fuse before it kills your equipment. As I mentioned earlier in the video, all normal power boards are rated for up to 50 amps continuous and up to 100 amps continuous for the HC or high current versions. Another thing all power boards will get is a built-in voltage meter display. This can quickly show you what the current input voltage is, especially handy when you have a mixed voltage stack, but it can also help you visualize if you're maybe having a lot of voltage drop and should, for instance, uh, increase the wire size coming into your board or things like a malfunctioning power supply, which can't quite live up to its stated ratings. And last, all power boards have a broken fuse indicator light per output, which only engages if something is connected to that port, so that if there's an open fuse spot with nothing attached to its output, the broken fuse indicator light will remain off. But if a fuse does pop and you have an LED strip connected to it or an LED string, it'll show you a nice little red light indicating which socket or which fuse popped. Then a few other things of note, all boards have input fuses and output fuses. Once you start upping the amount of power and have 
multiple links between your power supply and a power board or a board in general, it becomes more important to have input fuses. With an even split of three, like on the normal power boards, there would be about 16 amps per cable being transported. Now, this is never perfectly divided. However, it won't differ more than a few amps either way. Make sure to always use the same size and length wires for all three. That is important to remember. But say one, or in worst case, even two cables would come loose or they would short circuit somehow. Generally, the power supply will still happily keep providing power, overloading that only cable that is now left. The input fuses prevent such scenarios and make sure that almost whatever the situation, a fuse is guarding safety. So those are all shared features that apply to all the power boards. So now let's take a look at what makes them unique, starting with the Power 5. The Power 5 was designed with stacking in mind. It uses a traditional setup where the positive and negative are together on a single plug and it has 12 output ports, eight on the front and four on the right side when looking from the front. These plugs are pluggable 5.08 millimeter Phoenix style connectors and they come delivered with the mill end to which you attach your wires and then plug into the board. I've paid special attention for everything in the system to have plus type or Phillips head screws because that has my strong preference. But you can also get these same style with uh, flat hat screws or in various other styles like uh, screwless connections even. But, well, you'll have to buy those yourself if you want to switch to those. The plugs that come with the board are able to accept 14 gauge wire or up to two millimeter square with wire ferrules on them. The pluggable nature of these connections and the Power 5 makes the board ideally suited for stacking since all connections are accessible from the sides. Even replacing a fuse while stacked is possible with a little bit of finger nimbleness and the broken fuse indicator lights are positioned at the edge of the board, making it very easy to detect which fuse is blown. As mentioned before, this is a normal power board, so it's rated for up to 50 amps continuous and per output, the max rating is 10 amps. Although this style of connection will start to show a relatively high amount of voltage drop and thus also heat when running with that much current through one of the connections. Okay, I think that covers most of what makes the Power 5 unique. Next up is the Power 7. The Power 7 takes a different approach and instead of combined positive and negative pluggable terminals, it uses spread out banks split between positive and negative with non-pluggable screw terminals. There are four banks of eight times 7.62 millimeter screw terminals on the board, of which two of the banks are positive and two of the banks are negative, each on their own side of the board. These 7.62 millimeter screw terminals allow large diameter wires and easily take up to 12 gauge wire or 3.3 millimeter square wires again with wire ferrules. The total power and output rating per terminal is the same as the Power 5 at 50 amps total and 10 amps per port respectively, but because of the construction of the output terminals, there is a bit less voltage drop and heat versus the Power 5 at high loads uh, for an output terminal. But if that isn't enough for you, the unique layout of this board allows for something I call the double up feature which allows you to connect up to eight gauge or 8.3 millimeter square cable to two output ports at the same time using a fork style crimp. This effectively doubles the output limit, raising it from 10 amps to 20 amps for that single cable. If that's not enough to get your LED current where it needs to go with as low as possible voltage drop, I don't know what it is. The Power 7, however, also has some design downside and that is in regards to stackability. Once a power board is stacked above it, it becomes hard to change the wires connected to the board since a normal screwdriver can't reach the top of the terminals anymore. There is however a special tool which can still be used to screw or unscrew terminals even while stacked. However, the fuse and broken fuse indicator lights are not reachable or visible anymore after stacking and to replace the fuse, it will mean taking apart the stack to do so. It's not a lot of work, but 
uh, you know, I, I, I can get that's bothersome. So that might take a little bit of planning in regards to stacking. Maybe you have a combined stack with a power five and power seven, then make sure the power seven is at the top. And well, while you often need less power than you might think at first glance, my real world LED power sheet can help you figure out how much you really need. I have one last board I'd like to introduce as part of the Dig Octa system. And well, I've mentioned it before, it's the Power 7 HC, where HC stands for high current. Instead of the normal 50 amps per board, this board can support up to 100 amps continuous of power flowing through the board, allowing you to run a huge amount of LEDs, even if those are five volt LEDs. This did require a rework of the input section of the board combined with some other design changes, including much more copper in the board. So please be mindful of this when selecting a HC power board. You need special equipment to prepare your power cables to connect to it. A bare wire or with a wire ferrule will not work. You will need either a ring, fork or a lug style connection. So please keep that in mind. It also uses different types of fuses, uh, although they're general, they're generally available. Still, it's, it's a bit more difficult to work with in that regard. Other than that, most features of this board are the same as on the regular Power 7. It's just designed to handle a whole lot more. And well, that's it really about the power boards. They are meant to help you with providing stable and safe power to use for your LEDs. Sometimes a mistake is quickly made or with having LEDs outside, a short circuit can happen at an unexpected moment. And then having these protection mechanisms in place can at least hopefully prevent a fire and in best case, save your equipment. So these were the basic introduction videos to the system. We have the system introduction, the brain board introduction, and the power board introduction. As I feared, we've slightly veered off the deadline date I had set, and we're currently looking at the second week of October that the boards will be available. But with available, I do mean in stock and purchasable. Before that time, I'll try and add more video showing how the stacking and other functions work of the system. But you know, the, the basic videos are these three. If not, and you want to learn more, I've also been hard at work at creating an article section on my website. Please treat these as still a work in progress, but there is already a lot of information in there. And well, as always, let me know what you think. And I hope to see you back in the next video. Bye-bye.